Hello, welcome. This is the Outer Limits of Reasoning. We're doing Chapter 4, um, which is about infinity puzzles. Okay, my name is Dustin Yanofsky. Okay, so Chapter 4 is about infinity, and there are no infinite things in this world. There's only a finite amount of particles, there's only a finite amount of ways of arranging things. Okay, so if you're going to deal with infinity, the only thing we have is really sets. Or, which are concepts, ideas, or more particularly, sets of numbers. So we're going to deal a lot with sets of numbers and show how they're related. But we need, section 4.1 is like a, an inter, uh, introduction just about what sets are all about, mostly f dealing with finite sets, which is something familiar to most people, and we'll deal with it. Okay, So we can have the following sets. Set A, B, C. No, I'm sorry. Set A, B, A, which is the elements A, B, C. We can have the set B, which is the elements X, Y, Z, W. We can have the set C, which is students in this class. We can have D. Um, U.S. citizens, okay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Lots of different um, sets in the world. By the way, all these are finite sets. Okay, so first thing is we have to do a lot of different symbols that we have to learn. First symbol is how many elements are in the set. So for A, we have three. For B, we have 4. For C, we have 40. Okay. For D, whoops, look at that. For C, we have 40. For D, we have about 320 million. Okay. Okay, good. So that's the first symbol. We place these two vertical bars and we get the number of elements. But that's not really interesting. We're going to use it every day, but it's not really interesting. Next one. We say A is an element of capital A. That means it's inside. Okay. Um, B is an element of capital A. That's another element in there. Okay. And we have the letter D is not an element of A. Okay, so we can describe things like that. Okay, um, 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 A is not an element of capital B. Okay, Z is an element of capital B. Okay, and each one of you are an element of this class, and each one of you, oh, well, I don't know if everyone's an element, but there's 320 million citizens. Okay, so this little symbol, this Greek letter, tells you what's in it and what's not. Great, next. Okay, the next symbol is as follows. If I have two sets, S and T, all right, S is a subset, subset of T, okay? And what does that mean? It means every element in here is an element of here, okay? So let's take this set E, okay? And that's going to have um, A, B, C, D, E, okay? And so we can write S is a subset of T. We can write as follows. So this is abstract, but more in particular, A is a subset of E. Why? Because every element of A is an also an element of E. Okay, so let me give you another example. Let's do F is females in the class. So we have Females is a subset of C. Okay? Most important, 
very important thing. You have to know the difference between this symbol and this symbol. Okay, let's go through it. Okay, this symbol says here's an element, here's a set, this element is a s inside the set. This symbol says here's a set, here's a set, every element in this set is an element in this set. So this is between a element and a set, this is between a set and a set. Different things, okay? But obviously they're related, and they're related as follows. Let's show you how they're related. Okay? S is a subset of T means, another way of saying that is, if X is in S, that implies X is in T. Okay? So let's do, let's do the, the F is a set of females in the class, is a subset of the students in the class. Let's see why. Because every female in the class is also a student in the class. Okay? Okay. What's just symbols? If X is an S, that implies that X is in T. That's exactly what that means. Okay, great. Next symbol. S proper subset. So this is what this means. Proper subset. We also write it sometimes as follows, S subset of T, where we leave out the line. But when we want to stress that it's not equal, we put that in. So that's called a proper subset, which means, okay, let's see what it means. It means S is a subset of T and S is not equal to T. Okay, they're not equal. In other words, there's something, the way to think of it is a picture. Here's your T, here's your S. There's something in T that's not in S. Okay, I didn't really describe what equal is, so, so let's go backwards and describe what equal is. Okay, so let's talk about that. Okay, so what does it mean for two sets to be equals? S equals T if S is a subset of T and T is a subset of S. S is a subset of T and T is a subset of S. Okay, whenever you have this, that, uh, let's, let's, let's say what it means. It means every element in S is an element in T and every element in T is also an element in S. We can write this in symbols as follows. If S is uh, if X is in S, that implies X is in T. That's what this means. Okay, and now we're going to do this. If T is an element of, if X is an element of T, then it's also an element of S. So we can write this like this. Okay, if X is in S, that means X is in T. If X is in T, that means X is in S. Okay, so let me give you an example of two sets that are equal, but obviously not a, okay, so we have the set A, B, C is going to equal to the set C, B, A. Let's see why that's true. It's obvious, but let's see why it's true. Because A is here, well, A is here also. B is here, B is over here also. C is here, C is here also. And we go the other way. C is here, C is here, B is here, B is here, A is here, A is here. So whatever's in this set is in this set. But what we see from this is that it doesn't matter what the order you put your elements in. So when we talk about a set, we don't care about the order of the elements. As long as they're in there, they're in there. Let me give you another thing. Ready? A, B, C is equal to A, B, C, B. 
Okay, let's go through, see why it's equal. Because every element in here is an element in here. Every element in here is an element in here. Now, we have a repetition, B. But, it doesn't matter. B is here, B is here. So it doesn't matter. They're still equal. The point here is that because they're equal, what we say is that order doesn't, I'm sorry, repetition doesn't matter. When we're talking about sets, repetition doesn't matter. If you have a repeated element, it doesn't bother us. Okay, now, what does it mean that S is not an element in T? That means one of these is not true. Okay, and so if we say S is a proper subset of T, what we mean is S is a subset of T, okay, and S is not equal to T. What that re another way of saying this is S is a subset of T, and T is not a subset of S. Okay, one of them becomes not true. Okay. okay, and that fits in with your thing. If this is T, this is S. S is a subset of T, but T is not a subset of S. Okay, so we got a lot of different symbols that we have to um, keep up with. Okay, but the main thing is a proper subset means it's really smaller. There are less elements. A subset could be equal. Okay, the whole set could be equal. So, for example, A, B, C is a subset of A, B, C. It's not a proper subset, but it is a subset. Okay, great. Let's talk about some other symbols and other ideas. Okay, so let's talk about some other symbols. So, there's a set like this, it has a fancy name, I'm sorry, a fancy symbol. It's called the empty set. Okay? And we can also write it like this. Okay? It means the set with no elements whatsoever. We're always talking about elements in a set. This set has no elements whatsoever. Okay? And now we come to our first real idea, theorem. For all sets S, we have the following. The empty set is a subset of S. For all sets S, the empty set is a subset of S. Okay, let's see why. Because look what it says. Anything that's in here is in here. Well, there is nothing in here. So it's true. It's like me saying, anybody who f can fly, okay, can spread their arms and fly in this class is going to get an A+. Plus. Well, this is the set of students that are going to get an A+. Plus. This is the set of students who can fly. But that statement is true. Anybody who can fly in this class will get an A+. Plus. Okay, that's true. Okay, so this is true for every single set. Okay, great. Next, let S be a set. Okay, now we do this. That's a script S. Okay, is the, and we call it the power set of S. The power set of S. Okay. What is it? Okay. It is the set of subsets of S. The set of subsets of S. We'll see an example in a second. Okay, but you take it, you take a set S, the power set is another set, but it's, 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 it's the set of subsets of S. Okay, so let's do an example. Okay, 
I'm going to need a lot of room here, so I'm going to do the example over here. Leave me some space. If you're taking notes, leave me some space because we're going to do other sets. So the power set of the set A, B, C, what are the subsets of this set? Well, first of all, we're going to make a set of them. Okay. One of the things I said is every for every set, one of the subsets is the empty set. Okay. What other subsets does this set have? Well, the set that contains A, the set that contains B, the set that contains C, the set that contains a, B, the set that contains um, A, C, the set that contains A, B, and the set that contains A, B, C. Okay, let's just count how many there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, notice all of these subsets, all of these are subsets, all but this one is a proper subset. Okay, that's not a proper subset. Okay, so there are seven proper subsets, there are eight subsets, and there are seven proper subsets. Let's go back a little bit. How many subsets, or what subsets are here? Well, again, every set has, a, the empty set is a subset. This also has the set A. This also has the set B. And this also has the set A, B. Okay. Notice, this has four elements. Okay, there are four subsets. One, two, three of them are proper subsets. Okay. Let's go a little bit easier. The empty set and the set A. This has two subsets. One of them is proper, one of them is the whole set. Okay? And just to make it even more, let's just fill it in. What is a subset of the empty set? Well, the only thing there is the empty set. Okay, notice this has one element, this has two elements, this has four elements, this has eight elements. Can you guess how many elements are in this set? A, B, C, D. Okay, let's go through it again. One, two, four, eight. How many elements are this set? Okay, and so I want to show you how many elements, I want to show you the idea. The idea is as follows. Cover over this D. Okay? And we have the same thing here. So we can write the same thing here. So let's do it. You have the empty set, you have the same the set A, you have the set B, you have the set C, you have the set A B, you have the set A C A B in A, B, C. But hold on. That's with the D covered. But now I want all the subsets with the D also. So let me give you an example of all the sets. With the, well, let's continue our list because we're not finished. So let's do it. I'm going to put the D into the empty set. That gives us the set containing D. It also A, D. Also B, D. I'm putting the D in here. I'm putting the D in here. I'm putting the I'm putting the D in here. I'm putting the D in here. I'm putting the D in there. Okay. I'm putting the D in there. And finally I'm going to put the D in here. Now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
just like 8 from before, but now I have this new element D, and I'm going to try the D can be in the subset, the D, the D cannot be in the subset, or the D can be in the subset, but well, this is 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There are 16 elements. Okay? So, basically, when you add a new element, you're doubling the amount of elements that there were before. Let's say that again. When you add one new element, you're, you take the set, the power set of the previous set, and you double that amount. Okay, because you're adding that new element to every single thing. So you're adding the D here, 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 here. You're adding the D to the previous element. Okay, great. Now let's make a rule out of it. Okay, and the rule goes as follows. If S has n elements, then the power set of S has 2 to the n elements. Okay, why? Because if S has n elements, then what are you going to do? You're going to take you're going to take the empty set. Okay, so let's do that again. Okay, well let's do some examples. The power set of the empty set. How many elements does that have? Answer one, because that has zero elements. Two to the zero is one. The power set of just a has this has one element. Two to the one. Two to the one is equal to 2. Okay, this is 2 to the 0, this is 2 to the 1. Okay, the power set of the set that has A and B in it has 2 to the 2, which is 4 elements. The power set of A, B, C has 2 to the 3, which is 8. Okay, and it goes on like that. Okay? But the way to see it is, look, this has no elements, so there's only one element in the power set. This has one, so I'm adding the one, so that makes it times two. So I get two. This has another b, I multiply it times two. Two times two is four. Uh, this has a c, I multiply it times two. I get eight. I get sixteen. I get thirty-two, etc., etc. So this says, if s has n elements, then how many times did you multiply by two? Two to the n elements. I just want to write this a little bit more mathy. I do it as follows. If S has n elements, that implies the power set of S has 2 to the n elements. Okay, that's writing the same thing. Just This is in English, and this is in if S has n elements, then the power set, the set of subsets of S, has 2 to the n elements. just want to write it one other way. Okay, we write it as follows. The power set, this is just no symbols, only symbols, of S is equal to 2 to the number of elements in S. Okay, this relates how many elements in the power set with the number of elements in the set. Okay, great. Okay, one more concept, and we are done for the first section. Okay, and it goes as follows. The concept is called equinumerous. And the idea is as follows. The set A, B, C is not equal to the set X, Y, Z. They're not even a subset of each other. Why? Because this has A, B, and C. This has X, Y, and Z. They have different elements. Okay? However, they are equinumerous with each other. Okay? So we, okay? And the re what that means is they have the same number of elements. This has three elements. This has three elements. They have the same number of elements. Therefore, they're the same equi and the same numerous, the same number 
of elements. Okay, and I'm going to write that as follows: A, B, C. Okay, let's just write it as like this. This means the number of elements in this set is the same as the number of elements in this set, but I want to write it with another symbol, and so we do it as follows: A, B, C is not equal to x, y, z, okay, but they're the same size. And so I do that with a curly equal sign, okay, a wavy equal sign, okay. And so whenever you see two sets that have the same number of elements, you can write it with that symbol, okay. And I just want to show you how you show two elements are the same. Obviously this is the stupidest thing in the world. If I can match up every element in this set with an element in this set, okay, I can match up every element in one set with an element in the other set, in other words, pair them off, okay, um, then I can show that the two elements, the two sets are the same size, okay, so for example, okay, I have five fingers on my right hand, I have five fingers on my left hand, I can match them up, Okay, and therefore I have the same number of elements in both sets. Again, this is obvious and simple, um, but it gets very much more interesting when we talk about infinite sets. Okay, so that's about sets. Let's go give you some other things. Okay, here's a set G, which equals to the governors in USA. Okay. S equals states in USA, okay, how many governors there are, how many states there are, and so we can say the set of G is the same, equinumerous, the same size, they're not the same sets, okay, this has people in it, this has states in it, they're not the same sets, but they have the same size. Okay, notice this doesn't work for senators. You take the set of senators in the United States, you take the set of states in the United States, they don't match up one to one. Why? Because for every state, there are two different senators. Okay, so there are a hundred senators, there are fifty states, they don't match up. Okay, let's do another example. You have the set of people in the United States, you have the set of noses in the United States. Okay, those are match up. Okay, for every person there's a nose. For every nose there's a person. They match up very nicely. Okay, it does not work with ears. Right, because every person has two ears. Okay, so it works like that. Okay, now this is a very simple concept. Okay, but, and it works very well with finite sets. Okay, but it gets a lot more interesting when we talk talking about infinite sets, which we'll do in one second. And that's the beginning of the next section. Okay, but you have to understand this concept of two, set, two sets not being the same, but being the same size. Very interesting. Okay, let's start section 4.2. Okay, section 4.2. This is all about infinite sets now. Okay, and let's go through this. Like I said, there are no, there's a finite number of particles in the universe, so there are no infinite sets in the universe. The only thing that we have is, I'm sorry, there are no infinite things in the universe. The only thing we have is sets, and we have sets of numbers. Okay, so before we even get busy, I want to just list off some sets of numbers that we have. So we have positive numbers, these are whole numbers, okay, and we have natural numbers, which is the same thing as positive numbers, just zero is added in. Now you might think, oh, this is a simple idea, but we didn't have this in Europe, we didn't have this till, till the Middle Ages, okay, and when we got it, it was considered a radical idea. Okay, so zero is added in. Okay, and that's fine until again the Middle Ages when they wanted bankers wanted to talk about not only having money but owing money. Um, so they started talking about 
positive and negative numbers. Okay, so the idea is as follows. If you have five oranges and you take away eight oranges, how many oranges do you have? The question doesn't make sense because if you can't take away eight oranges if you have only five oranges. But bankers use this phrase and say, you know what, this is a concept of negative three. Positive three means you own. Negative three means you owe. Okay, but fine. So this starts off from a negative infinity till negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. Okay, these are called positive numbers. These are called natural numbers. They show up in nature. Okay, Z is a German word, but uh, which stands for Zeitung or counting, whatever. But they wanted to include the negatives. Okay, but these um, are called whole numbers, all whole numbers, positive and negative, or integers. Okay, and you got to get the names right because we're going to spend the next hour talking about these things. Okay, finally, not finally, but next is Q, um, which is fractions. Where M and N, they're fractions, and where M and N are, are in Z, but we make the requirement that Z N is not zero. Okay, and so these are called fractions or quotients, hence the word the letter Q, or rational numbers. Okay, and the f these are called the real numbers. Okay, um, and it's what your teacher drew the first day of ninth grade. He said 0, 1, minus 1, 2, 1 1.5. Um, over here you're going to have pi. And over here you're going to have the square root of 2. So this contains r rational numbers and irrational numbers. Numbers that can't be written as the square root of two numbers. Okay? Now, these are related to each other as follows. The positive number is a proper subset of the natural numbers, which is a proper subset of z, which is a proper subset of q, which is a proper subset of r. And by the way, we can go on with this. There's things called the complex numbers, which are about imaginary numbers. There's things called H quartonians. There's something called octonians. They can go on, but we're not going to be interested in them. Um, and so we're just going to deal with these. Okay, so this is what, this is the sets that we're going to use. Okay. And again, it's a historical development as how they came along, but that's not that's not our discussion at the moment. We're going to spend most time with this set, the natural numbers. Okay, we're going to spend a lot of time with that today. Okay, great. Now that we have those, let me tell you a story. Okay, and the story is a story about Hilbert's Hotel. It's a famous story, and it's here to teach you something about infinity. Okay, this concept about infinity. And the story is supposedly goes back to a David Hilbert, who was a mathematician in the beginning of the 20th century, who spent time working with infinity, and so he wanted to tell you tell stories to make it understandable. So he says as follows: Imagine you own a hotel, okay, and you have 300 rooms in this hotel. That's very nice. Okay, and let's say one night all your rooms are occupied. Everything's occupied, so you put up a sign, no full, don't bother, leave me alone. And there's too many people. Okay, I'm not too many, there's just the right. I have 300 rooms, I have 300 people in, in, the thing, in my hotel. Okay, 
So 300 rooms are totally occupied. Along comes a car, and somebody comes up, and he says he wants a bed. He wants another room. Okay. So what does the owner of the hotel do? Okay. Well, you can't put him in with anybody else, and so you say, I'm sorry, sir, we're full. Go to the next hotel down the road, and there's another hotel there, and you can stay there. That sounds good. Why? And the reason is, is because you have 300 rooms, not 301 rooms. Period. Okay? Nothing exciting there. Hilbert says, you know what? Imagine a hotel, Hilbert has a hotel, with an infinite number of rooms. Again, this is fantasy, because there are no such things as hotels with infinite number of rooms. But we're going to get a, a feeling for this. So let's say you have this hotel with an infinite number of rooms, and let's say you have an infinite number of customers inside each hotel room. Okay, so your hotel is full. Okay, what that means is that in every door there's some natural number. Okay, every hotel room door has some, every room has a room number and it's some natural number, and there is no final number. Okay, if you have a hotel with only 300 rooms, then you have a hotel room with number 299, you have a hotel, a hotel room 300, and you do not have a hotel room 301. But in the infinite hotel, you have a room for every single natural number. Okay? Now, imagine one night, every room is occupied. If you live in a, in a universe with an infinite number of rooms, you can have an infinite number of people, and so every single room is occupied. Along comes a car to the entrance of the hotel. And the car says, the guy says in the, in the car, he says, I'd like a room, another room. Okay, now we went through this. In the average finite set universe, okay, there's nothing you can do. You can tell the man to go away. But there is something you can do with the infinite hotel. Okay, now which room should you put him in? You can't put him to the last room because there is no last room. What's the largest whole number? There is no largest whole number. Okay? And every single room is full. But what you can do is as follows. You can get on to your handy dandy announcer okay, and call out. Hello, this is your manager. It's now 11.30. At 11.35 I want everybody to gather all their stuff and go into the next room. Okay, so if you're in room number 5, I want you to go into room number 6. If you're in room number 12, I want you to go into room number 13. If you're in room number 5,721, I want you to go into room number 5,722. Okay, if you're in room number N, I want you to go into room number N plus 1. Okay, so you do that. You get on your microphone, you do that. Everybody grabs their stuff. They're angry at the manager. Look at that. They're walking around in their pajamas. They're unhappy. But this is what the manager said. Everybody grabs their stuff, takes it out of room number N, carries it to room number N plus 1. Okay? Now, if you do that, if, if you do that and all your customers agree to it, you don't have to agree with it. You, they get kicked out in hell. You have an infinite number of rooms, you have the largest hotel, etc., etc., so they have to listen to you, okay? But the main point is, when you're finished, what do you have? Well, room number 15 is occupied, with people who used to be in room number 14. Room number 361 is occupied, with, use, with, with people that used to be in room 360. Okay, but what one room is not occupied? Okay, and the answer is room number zero is not occupied. Okay, the guy that was in room number zero now went to room number one, so it's not occupied. Okay, great. So, what do you do with the customer that came in the car? Very simple. Send him into room number zero. Problem solved. Okay? So that's an amazing thing. In a finite hotel, you have a finite amount of people you can't put another person in. But in an infinite hotel, you can fit in another person. Let me just show you what I just did. Okay? 
what I just did was as follows. The amazing thing wasn't getting in the new person, because that was simple. Room number zero was empty, you just sent them in. That wasn't the amazing thing is. But the amazing thing was, I had, for every natural number, I had a customer, okay, and I matched them up with the positive room numbers, okay? So we had, for every single number, including zero, we had a customer there, and then I matched them up with the positive numbers. And the way I did that was I sent the guy that was in room number one, sorry, I sent the guy that was in room number zero to one, I sent the guy that was in room number one to room number two, I sent the guy that was in room number two to room number three, room number three to room number four, dot dot dot, the room number n goes to room number n plus one. Okay, dot dot dot. Okay, so this is a scheme to match up these two sets. Now, this is a one-to-one -one onto mapping. This is an exact pairing, was the word I used, between this set and this set. Now, but there's something amazing going on here. What's the amazing thing? The amazing thing is the natural numbers has more than one, has one more element than this, than the positive numbers. This has zero, this does not. So how could you tell me that they're the same size when it doesn't make sense? So what I just showed you was that the natural numbers is equinumerous to the positive numbers. All the customers that were in these rooms are now in these rooms. That's an amazing thing. Yes, there are an infinite number of customers here. There are an infinite plus one customers here. But those things are equal. You can write this as follows. You have an infinite number of customers. I don't like that symbol, but that's equal to infinity plus one. Okay. That's a very strange thing, but that's true, okay? Okay, we, we showed you how to map them up. We showed you how to pair every element of this guy into one of those guys. Okay, worked out very nicely. Okay, let's go on with the story. The story goes on. Everybody's settled in, and now the, the new customer with his car, the new customer that came up in the car is in room number zero. Everybody's settled. Along comes a bus, a bus, and the bus has an infinite number of travelers, and each one wants their own room. Now, in a normal amount, in a normal finite place, there's nothing you can do. You can't even fit in one more person, let alone an infinite number of persons. In fact, you can never fit in an infinite number of persons in a normal amount, in a normal hotel. But this is Hilbert's hotel, so you can do some uh, interesting things, okay? What should you do? How do you set it up? Okay? And the answer is as follows. Ready? The manager gets on his loudspeaker, and he tells everybody, Hello, I need to move you again. And everybody groans. You have an infinite number of customers groaning and angry at the manager. He just wants to make more money and more money and more money. Okay, but now he doesn't want to move you over one seat. He wants to do the following. He says to you, he says to everybody, okay, at the same time, the infinite number of people, he says as follows. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's now 1140. At 1145, I want everybody to take their, all their stuff, and go from room number N to room number 2N. Let's see what that means. I want the people in room number 3 to go to room number 6. I want the people in room number 6 to go to room number 12. I want the people in room number 7 to go to room number 14. I want the people to go to room number 2021 to go to 4042. Okay? Every single person we should have N goes to 2N. Okay? So this person should go to six, seven thousand, etc. Et 
etc., etc. Every person should go to 2n. Okay, so let's see what happens then. Okay, everyone's going to do it. It's 11.45. Everyone's going to do it. They're going to be furious. They're going to be angry, but they're all going to go. They're going to look, open their door, look at the number, double that number, and go to, the net, go to that doubled of that number. Okay, the person in room number zero stays in room number zero because two times zero is zero. The person in room number one goes to room number two. The person in room number two goes to room number four, etc., etc. Okay, they all do this. At the end, what do you have? Well, you have your hotel. Okay, you have an infinite number of rooms, but where are all the customers? Answer, the customers are all in the even number rooms. They're in room number zero, they're in room number two, they're in room number four, they're in room number eight, six, eight, etc., etc. The odd number rooms, everybody in the odd number rooms moved into the even number rooms. Everybody in the even number rooms moved into the even number rooms. What do we learn from this? Well, before, well, what do we learn? What, do, what can we do now? We had a hotel full of people, and up to the hotel came a bus with an infinite number of people. Now what can we do with those bus travelers? Answer, we can send each and every one of the bus travelers to the odd number rooms. Okay, so we send each and every one of those travelers to the odd number rooms. Conclusion, you've, s you've settled everybody. Okay, whereas it was once full, now it's twice as... Well, it's still full, okay? But what did we do? What did we do? Well, we have the natural numbers, okay? And then we have another set, which we didn't talk about, called the even numbers. Zero, two, four, six, eight, dot, 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 okay? And what I showed was that you can make a pairing of every one of these guys which were in customers before, with every one of these guys, okay, which you now have. These are the even numbers. Okay, let's go through the pairing. Zero goes to zero. One goes to two. Two goes to four. Three goes to six. Four goes to eight. Dot, dot, dot. N goes to two N. Dot, dot, dot. Okay. You've matched up every single number with an even number. Now, you should be shocked by this because the natural numbers contains the even numbers, but it also contains the odd numbers. Okay. But we don't care about that because we had a nice definition of what it means to be equinumerous. Two sets are equinumerous if you can match them up. It made sense with finite numbers, now let's do it for infinite numbers. This set and this set can be matched up. They can, the elements can be paired off. Conclusion, this set is the same size as this set. We write it as follows. The natural numbers is the same size as the even numbers. That's a pretty shocking thing. That's a very shocking thing. Okay. Another way to write this is, the even numbers, there's an infinite number of even numbers. But how many natural numbers are there? Answer, there's the even numbers, but there's also the odd numbers. Okay, so we have infinity plus infinity is equal to infinity. That's a very shocking thing. Okay, great. So these two stories about Hilbert's Hotel, the one with the extra car and the one with the extra bus, bring us to the beginning of what we're talking about. So, what we try to show is, here's the natural numbers, and I'm going to make a whole chart over here, you're going to see this very, very often, and what we're going to show, what we just showed is, the natural numbers is the same size as the positive numbers. We also showed that the natural numbers is the same size as the even numbers. Okay, okay let's look at another set. the square numbers. These are numbers that can be written as a square. 
Um, 16, 25, 36, 49, dot, dot, dot. There's an infinite number of square numbers, okay? But the question is, how infinite? Okay? Well, it turns out that the square numbers are the same size as the natural numbers. Although there are fewer here, look, you're missing 3, you're missing 5, 6, 7, 8, you're missing 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you're missing a lot of numbers, but they can be matched up as follows. I can send 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 2 to 4, 3 to 9, 4 to 16, 5 to 25, 6 to 36, 7 to 30. n goes to n squared. I'm going to match that up. Okay? I'm showing you a scheme how to match up. Obviously, this set is infinite. I can't show you every single one. This set is infinite. I can't show you every single one. But I'm showing you a scheme how to match these numbers to these numbers. Since I have these this scheme, it turns out that the square numbers, although it seems that there's a lot fewer square numbers than natural numbers, but no, they're the same size. Okay, so this is another shocking thing. By the way, this idea goes back to Galileo. This idea is 500 years old. Galileo realized that these two sets have the same number of elements. Okay, great. What else? What else has the same number of elements? So, we've been taking these sets and we're looking for smaller sets that don't have the same Okay, and we're looking for smaller sets and seeing, I mean, they're smaller in the sense that they have fewer elements. The square numbers have fewer. This is a proper, this is a proper subset of this. This is a proper subset of this. This is a proper subset of this. Positive numbers don't have zero. This has zero. This is the even numbers, don't have the odd numbers. Square numbers, you don't have the non-square numbers. Let's look at another one. PR for prime. Okay, let's remember what a prime number is. A prime number is a number that only itself and one goes into. Okay, zero is not a prime number, one is not a prime number, two is a prime number, three is a prime number, four is not, five is a prime number, six is not, seven is a prime number, eight is not, nine is not, nine is three times three, ten is not, eleven is a prime number, twelve is not, thirteen 13 is a prime number, 14 is not, 15 is not, 16 is not, 17, 17 is a prime number, 18 is not, 19, 19 is a prime number, 20 is not, 21 is not, 22 is not, 23, 23 is not, is, is a prime number, whoops, 23 is a prime number, I'm getting bored. 24, 25, 26, 26 is 2 times 13, 27 is 3 times 9, 28, 29, 29. Oh, anyways. Okay. okay, so there's even fewer prime numbers because as you get, in the, as the numbers get bigger, more things can divide into it. Okay, and yet, watch this. I can match them up. This is the zeroth prime number, this is the first prime number, this is the second prime number, this is the third prime number, fourth prime number, fifth prime number, sixth prime number, okay, etc, etc. And I'm going to send n to the nth prime number. Okay? And again, there's an infinite number of prime numbers. They are scarce. There are fewer of them than these guys but they have the same number of elements, okay? And so, prime numbers are the same size. Okay, now all four of these sets, the positive numbers, the even numbers, the square numbers, the prime numbers, they all are seemingly smaller than the natural numbers. They are proper subsets of the natu natural numbers, and yet 
miraculously, the miracle of infinite numbers, they are the same size as the natural numbers. Okay, they're equinumerous. Okay, good. What about larger sets? What are about sets that have more numbers than the natural numbers? Okay, so I want to talk about Z. Okay, and I'm going to write Z a funny way. I'm going to write Z. Z, remember, is positive and negative numbers. Okay, so Z has both the positive numbers and the negative numbers. You would think, hey, look, here's the natural numbers already. There's no way in the world you're going to include these numbers also. Okay, there's here's the positive numbers that can sh th that's already infinite. There's no way in the world you're going to match up to the negative numbers also. It's just not going to happen. Okay, but when we match up numbers, when we match up things, it doesn't matter how you match them up, as long as you can match them up. Okay? We talked about the number of fingers on my right hand and the number of fingers on my left hand. This is an obvious way of matching it up. But I could have matched them up like this also, and I could, if I was good enough with my fingers, match them up a different way also. It doesn't matter because here's five elements, here's five elements, and there are, I don't know, about five factorial different ways of matching them up one to one. Great. So I want to talk about a different way of matching these up with the natural numbers. Turns out that they are the same size and I'd like to show you how to do it. Okay. Here I'm going to write the natural numbers. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. Okay, and here I'm showing you this matching, how to do this matching. So, I'm going to do it very carefully. I'm going to send 0 to 0. That makes sense. I'm going to send 1 to 1 and 2 to minus 1. I'm going to send 3 to 2 and 4 to minus 2. I'm going to send 5 to 3 and 6 to minus 3. 7 to 4, 8 to minus 4. 9 to 5, 10 to minus 5, okay, 11 is going to go to 6, 12 is going to go to minus 6, dot, dot, dot. Now, this goes on forever and ever, this goes on forever and ever, this goes on forever and ever, okay, but I've successfully matched up the two, two sets. Let me just show you what I just did. What I did was I took Z, which is seemingly larger than the natural numbers, because this has the positive and negative numbers. This is just has the positive numbers. And I've shown, no, they're the same size. Okay. Now, I'm going to write a function that actually does this. But beforehand, I just want to get a feeling of what this is going on. What this is, this is the Z. There are both... In, in some say there are two-way infinity. It's infinite this way and it's infinite this way. The natural numbers is infinite only one way and yet this one way what we're able to do is we're able to match it up pretty nicely. Okay? Very nice. Okay? I'd like to actually write a function that does this. And the function is as follows. F goes from the natural numbers to Z Okay, I'm describing this relationship, okay, and it's as follows. f of n is one of two things. It's either n is even, okay, so let's do this. Where did I send 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc., etc.? Well, if you look what I did, I send 6 to negative 3, so I take n, I divide it by 2, it's even, so I can divide it by 2, and then I multiply it by n. That's what happens when I meet when n is even. 
What about when n is odd? Okay, so then I do as follows. Look at this. 3 goes to 2, 5 goes to 3, 7 goes to 4. Here's what I do. If n is odd, okay, what I do is I take n, if n is odd, I take n, add 1 to it. Then n, is e n plus 1 is even, and then divide it by 2. And that's what I sent to. Let's do this. 9 plus 1 is 10, divided by 2 is 5. 11 plus 1 is 12, divided by 2 is 6. 13 plus 1 is 14, divided by 2 is 7. I'm going to match up like that. Okay? So this function describes this equinumerous, this pairing between these two sets. Now again, let's just go through this. Z, I'm sorry, the natural numbers, is a proper subset of Z. Okay? Natural numbers is a proper subset of Z. Okay? And it's very um, doable. Okay? It's a proper subset of this. This contains only the whole positive numbers and zero. This contains the positive numbers, zero, and the negative numbers. Nevertheless, they are equinumerous. Okay, I'd like to show you the same proof again, but in a different way, because we're going to see this same idea over and over. So I'm going to do it as follows. I'm going to rewrite Z. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, minus 6, dot, dot, dot. This goes dot, dot, dot. Okay, and what I want to do now is I want to think of the natural numbers as a large snake. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, forever and ever. I want to think of it as a, a large snake. And what I want to do is I want to match the natural numbers to, to, the, to, the, to the integers. Every natural number should correspond to an integer. And here's what I do. Okay? I do it as follows. I send 0 here. I send 1 here. I send minus 1 here. I send 2 here. I send minus 2 here. I send 3 here. I send minus 3 here. I'm sorry. didn't say that right. Okay? I send 0 here, 1 here, 2 here, 3 here, 4 here, 5 here, 6 here, 7 here, 8 here, 9 here, 10 here, etc., etc. I keep on going back and forth. Eventually, every single number, every single integer, like the number uh, 523, well, we're going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm going to hit 523. 523 is going to be hit by this giant snake. The number negative 361, back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, eventually I'll hit that number. Okay? The conclusion is, is these numbers can be hit. Every single number of these numbers will be hit. Conclusion, they're the same size. Don't tell me this is twice the size of this. They're actually the same size. Okay? That takes care of that. Okay? I'd like to do another set in a second. Um, but let me erase this. Okay, so let's look at another set which is seemingly larger. And the other set which is seemingly larger is the natural numbers cross the natural numbers. Now let me tell you where you saw this before, this concept of this cross. It's called the Cartesian product, but let's just remember what happened. The first day of ninth grade, your teacher drew the, drew the, the real numbers. And he said, this is the real numbers. Very nice. The second day of ninth grade, the teacher drew this. He called this the Cartesian plane. Okay, and he said, this is the real numbers cross the real numbers. Same symbol. Okay, and what the idea is that every single point here, 5.832, four point one two five every single point has two real numbers okay great 
I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the natural numbers coming natural num across the natural numbers, where every single element here is two natural numbers. Now I put them, and I put them in order over here. So you have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, okay, like this. Now, 4, 0, 4, 1, this goes on forever and ever, this goes on forever and ever. Okay, just like these go on forever and ever. In two ways, this goes on forever and ever. Okay, now, you might say, look, down here already you have the natural numbers. Okay, in this row you also have the natural numbers. In this row you have the natural numbers. In every single row you have the natural numbers. You might say, this is an infinite copies of the infinite sets. This is, this is way more than the natural numbers. There's no way you're going to get... Um, this. In fact, we can match up. One goes here, two, zero goes here, one goes here, two goes here, three goes here, four goes here, etc., etc. Okay? Um, and if you do that, you'll never hit any of the other numbers. So it would seem that this set, the natural numbers cross the natural numbers, is larger than just the natural numbers. Okay? Another way to look at it is the natural numbers is one long strip that long infinite snake infinite goes on but it's it's one dimensional as opposed to that this is two dimensionally infinite it goes this way and this way forever and ever so how could one dimensional infinite be the same as two dimensional infinite okay but like i said with the fingers it doesn't matter how you match them up Okay, how you match up the fingers on your left hand with the right hand. So too, it doesn't matter how you're going to match up the natural numbers with this. And so I'd like to do it. Okay, and here's the way it's done. This is called a zigzag proof, but it works. I'm going to send zero from the natural numbers. Again, think of the natural numbers as a long, giant snake. Okay, I'm going to send zero here. And I'm going to send one here. But I'm not going to go on forever and ever because then I'd miss these guys. So I'm going to send two here. I'm going to send three here, four here, five here, six here, seven here, eight here, nine here, ten here, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, da da da. Okay? Zigzag back and forth, back and forth, just like I did with the with the thing with the with the with the integers. Try to hit every single number, and I am. I'm going to hit every single number. I destroyed my pen, but that's okay. I hit every single number, including over here is a number five hundred and thirty-seven, comma three hundred and eighty-one. Well, guess what? Eventually, that number will be hit, and so it's going to be there. So what I just showed was that the natural numbers is the same size, it's equinumerous to the natural numbers cross the natural numbers. Okay, and that's an amazing thing. Okay, so again, this two-dimensional infinite thing is the same size as the natural numbers. So I'm going to write it over here with all the rest of the things that are the same size as the natural numbers. Okay. And so far, every single set that we've, sh every single infinite set of natural numbers, or, or things of it, uh, made of natural numbers, seems to be the same size as that. Okay, great. Let's move on. What about fractions? That's the next set. Now let me just tell you, fractions seems to be even larger than than this set. Well, let me just explain to you why it's larger. Okay. Consider the fraction 6 over 8 and 7 over 8. Okay, two fractions. Okay, 6 over 8, by the way, you can divide by 2, you get this is 3 over 4, but that's okay. We'll leave it like that. Now, doesn't look like there's any fractions in between there, but there are fractions in between there. Let's multiply the bottom and the top by 10. So this becomes 60 over 80, and this becomes 70 over 80. That's very interesting. 
But in between here is the following numbers, 61 over 80, 62 over 80, 63 over 80, dot, 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 69 over 80. There are 10 numbers in between there. Okay? And between 62 over 80 and 63 over 80, we can do the following. We can multiply the top and the bottom by 10. We got 800 on the bottom. We have 620 on the, on the top. Okay? And we have 630 on the top and 800 on the bottom. And there are 10 numbers in between here, at least. 625 over 800. Okay? So there's a lot of numbers. I can do this over and over and over. The point is between any two fractions, there's an infinite number of fractions in between them. So how could it possibly be that the rational numbers, the fractions, should be the same size as the natural numbers. How could that possibly be? After all, between any two natural numbers, let's say between 5 and 13, there's only 8 natural numbers. There's no infinite numbers. But between any two fractions, there's an infinite number of numbers. How could it be that this set should be the same size as this set? And lo and behold, guess what? They are. They are the same size. I don't want to go through the proof. Okay? The proof is in the book, and it's another one of these zigzag pictures. Okay? And I want to just show it to you. Don't move. It's on page 75. Okay? Well, you can see it here, but you should look at it on the page. I, I matched off all the natural numbers. I'm sorry, all the fractions. And they go two-dimensional infinite two ways. They go across like this, across like this, down, because of positive and negative numbers, and they go this way also. And I call this proof the zig, it's a zigzag proof, or the necklace proof. Okay, because I snake the natural numbers along, around and around and around and around and around, and every single fraction will eventually be hit this way. Conclusion, the fractions are also the same size as the natural numbers. Let's put that down. Fractions, the set of rational numbers, is the same size as the natural numbers. Okay. Great. Let's review. So far, we had all these sets which are seemingly smaller than the natural numbers, lo and behold, they're the same size as the natural numbers. All these sets, these three sets, which are seemingly larger than the natural numbers, they're, they're actually the same size as the natural numbers. So all these different sets are equinumerous with each other. They're all kind of equal to each other. Okay? Obviously they're not equal, but they have the same number of elements. They're all infinite, and that's it. Great. Okay. We are now set finished section 4.2. Let's move on to another section. Section 4.3. Okay. And section 4.3 asks the following question. Is there anything larger? Is there anything bigger than the natural numbers? Okay. Okay. Now all these ideas came from one guy named George Cantor. He lived in the 1890s. And he thought of all these clever tricks of pairing off these different sets and showing that they're really the same size. And Cantor said, okay, what about the real numbers? And Cantor tried to do the same type of trick. So here's the real numbers. 0, 1, minus 1, minus 2, minus uh, 2, 3, etc., etc., etc. But Cantor said... What about all these numbers? Okay, but not only these numbers, but all decimals inside. 1.86324752. Anyways, Cantor tried for a lot of different tricks of matching the natural numbers to all these numbers. So he said, you know what? Let me do it in black pen, otherwise I ruined the 
He says, well, let me try to send zero here, and then I'm going to send one here, and then I'm going to send two here, and then I'm going to send three here, and then I'm going to send four here, and then I'm going to send five here, and then I'm going to send six here, seven here, eight here, nine here, ten here, etc., etc. He tried lots of different schemes to match up the natural numbers in the real numbers. He tried and he tried and he tried. In every scheme he tried, he had the following thing. He always found that he missed some, some real numbers. He was always missing some real numbers. And he got very frustrated. And to make a long story short, he went insane. Literally insane, thinking about these things. And they put him in an insane asylum. Okay? Eventually, he got out of the insane asylum. He promised his wife he wouldn't be thinking of these things, okay, and he, s and he stopped for a while, but then he started thinking about it, okay, and he said, you know what, it seems to me that these real numbers are very, very large, let me focus in on a smaller set. So he said, rather than dealing with all real numbers, let me focus in, here's zero, here's one. This is the interval zero comma one set of numbers between 0 and 1, from here till there, not including 0, not including 1. He said, let me try to match up the natural numbers the same size as 0, 1. He tried and he tried and he tried. Let's focus in what he was trying to do. He, was, he blew this picture up. Here's 0, here's 1. Here's 0.5, here's 0.25, here's 0.75, here's 0.632, um, etc., etc. And he was trying to match up the natural numbers with all these decimal numbers in between. So he tried lots of different tricks. He tried sending 0 here, 1 here, 2 here, 3 here, 4 here. That didn't work. He tried sending this here, this here, this here, this here, this here, this here, this here. That didn't work. Every single scheme that he had, he always found that he was missing some real numbers between 0 and 1. No matter what he did. Okay, he was very frustrated. Guess what? He started obsessing about it. They put him in an insane asylum. Okay? Eventually he came out of an insane asylum. And he kind of gave up but for a much more interesting reason. Not that he gave up because of mental health, because he realized something a lot more shocking, and that's the whole purpose of this chapter. He realized that the natural numbers is not equinumerous with the set 0, 1. Okay? So you have the set 0, 1 and natural numbers. He had spent a lot of his time trying to match this up with this, okay? And he failed. And the reason why he failed is because they're not equal. Okay? Think of a classroom with 25 students and 40 chairs. Okay? There's no way in the world you're going to put one student per chair and match up all the chairs with all the students. There are more chairs than students. Conclusion, you cannot match them up. So too, there are more of these guys than these guys. They cannot be matched up. They cannot be made into a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay? And that's a shocking realization. Now, you might say, hey, this is infinite. This is infinite. What's the difference? And that's, the, exactly, the, the, that's exactly the point. There are different levels of infinity. And because of there are different levels of infinity, they cannot be matched up. They can't be. They are not equinumerous. So I can't put this set over here because it's not the same size as this. Okay, And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to actually prove that there. Okay? I'd like to prove that it doesn't exist. Okay? And the proof is what's called a proof by contradiction. Okay? What we're going to do is we're going to assume the natural numbers is the same size as 0, 1. Okay? We're going to assume this is true. And we're going to get out a contradiction for that. Okay? And since we don't have contradictions in mathematics, it must be that our assumption is wrong. Okay? We saw this before with paradoxes. Okay, so let's do this right. Okay.
assume assume that there is some scheme that matches this up with this. So I'm going to write the scheme as follows. If there's some scheme it can be written. Okay, and now this is the natural numbers, and I'm going to match it up with all the numbers between 0 and 1. Okay, I'm going to write it like this. So, whatever the scheme is, and I'm not sure what the scheme is, and I've got to tell you, no such scheme exists, but imagine there was a scheme, then 0 would match up with, let's say, 0 0.3817256412. Eight, da, 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 da. That's a decimal number between 0 and 1. Okay? 1 will match up to 0 0.98... No, no, I want to do 8. Um, yeah, 9, 8, 3, 5, 6, 2, 4, 4, 4, 1, 2, 3, 9. 2 is going to match up with 0. 4, 4, 5, 4, 4, 5, 4, 4, 5, 4, 4, 5, da, 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 da. I made it up. 3 is going to match up with 0 0.5000000000000, da, 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 da. Look, that's a real number between 0 and 1. We have to hit that number, too. 4 is going to match up with 0 0.1234567891234 uh, da, 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 da. 5 is going to match up with 0 0.2213213 etc etc I'm getting bored okay the main point is there is some scheme that matches up this set with this set. Okay. Now, I claim that this scheme doesn't work. I want to show you why. Okay. I'm going to write down the digits. So this is how, what things show up after the digits. So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay. This is the zeroth number, the third digit. The the fourth number, the eighth digit. The fifth number, the fifth digit. Okay? Match them up. Okay. So, let's go through it again. What are we doing here? We're assuming these two sets are the same size. And so, I can ask the following. I, that means for every natural number, there is a real number between 0 and 1 that corresponds to it. I claim that that's not true. And the reason why it's not true is I'm going to find you a number here that's not in your listing. Let me show you the number. Ready? You have a 4 over here. I'm going to make it a 7. You have an 8 over here. I'm going to make it a 0. You have a... whoops. Second place. You have a 5 over here. I'm going to make it a 6. You have a 0 over here. I'm going to make it a 3. You have a 5 over here, I'm going to make it a 6. You have a 1 over here, I'm going to make it a 2. You have a 8 over here, I'm going to make it a 0. You have a 7 over here, I'm going to make it a 3. You have a 0 over here, I'm going to make it a 1, etc., etc. You have a 4 over here, I'm going to make it a 5. Dot, 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 dot. Okay, now let's look at this number. You ready? Zero point, let's read the number, seven, oh, six, three, six, two, zero, three, one, five, dot, dot, dot. Okay. okay, you ready? This number, I claim, is not on your list. Let me show you why it's not on your list. Okay. It's not the zeroth number, because the zeroth number in the zeroth position has a 3. This has a 7. Not there. It's not the first number, because the first number, the first digit of the first number, has an 8, and I have a 0. Not that number. It's not the second digit 
it's not the second number on our list because they're different at the second position. This has a 5, I have a 6. The, this number is not the third, it's not the fourth, it's not the fifth, it's not the sixth, it's not the seventh, it's not on your list. Okay? Because it was made, this number was made to be different than every number on the list. Conclusion, this number is not on the list. Now, whenever I teach this, somebody jumps up and he says, look, this is an infinite list. It's not the first few elements, but it's, it's on your list. Well, let me show you why it's not. You tell me this is on my list, this is on the scheme. There's some scheme that these numbers were chosen. What number is it? So tell me it's the 729th element. Okay? Claim that this, this number is on the list, it's the 729th element. Now I'm going to ask you the following question. What is the 729th digit of the 729th number? Okay, so we go here. Okay, and let's say that digit is a 5. Guess what I'm going to put here for the 729th digit? I'm going to put here a 6. So don't, oops, this is 7, let's make them, let's not make them both 729. Don't tell me that this number is the 729th element on the list because the 729th digit of the 729th number is a 5 and this number has a 6 there. So it's not the same number. It is not the same number. Okay? Conclusion, there's no way you can match this up. There's no way you're going to match the natural numbers, that's these guys, with every single one. There's going to be something missing. Okay? What I'm showing you is as follows. Let's walk into a classroom. 25 students, 40 chairs. There's no way in the world you're going to match up the 25 students one-to-one -one with every one, every one of those chairs. You're going to always miss a chair. You're always going to miss a number. Now, I can stand up the students and say, okay, you sit over there, you sit over there, you sit over there. I can move them around. But eventually, because there are 40 chairs and only 25 students, there's going to be empty chairs. There are going to be chairs in which a person doesn't sit on. Conclusion, there's no way to match them up. Okay. Now, whenever I do this, in class, there's always a student that pops up and he says, no, 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 the scheme you used is a wrong scheme. Let's try a different scheme. And I'm very patient and I listen to the students and he gives me another, he or she gives me another scheme and I put in their other scheme. And you know what? In that scheme that they're going to put in, they're going to make sure to put in that number that you just found because they, they saw that you missed that number before. Guess what happens? We put in the scheme, just like before, it's going to be a different scheme, but again, I can go through the diagonals and I can show you it's not there. There's going to be another number that's not there. Okay? If it's not there, that means this list is not a complete list. Conclusion. The natural numbers is not the same size as the set zero one. It is not the same size. Okay? They are not the same size. This is a new level of infinity. It's not the same size. Okay? There's no way to match up these things. They are not equinumerous. Okay. Great. Uh, just a, a minute. We have to meditate on this. Again, it's the normal thing to say, oh, infinity is infinity. But what we just showed was, and, and we spent the first hour of this class showing that many, many times. Showing that many different sets, which seemingly different sizes, no, infinity was infinity. The even numbers, the square numbers, the prime numbers, the rational numbers, the pairs of numbers, the integers, they all have the same number. But now we came to a new thing which shows that they're a different size. And that's an amazing thing. Okay, great. Let's go back to our original question. What about... We'll do it with the, okay. What about 
the, all the real numbers, not just from 0 to 1, that's here from 0 to 1. What about all the real numbers where this goes on forever and this goes on forever? It would seem here's just here's an infinity, an infinity larger than the natural numbers. Here's uh, the same size as that, infinity of the largest numbers. Here's the same size, here's the same size, here's the same size. Okay? You would think, look, this has infinite, this real numbers has infinite copies of 0 and 1, for all the numbers from 0 to 1. Okay? So you might think, wow, this is even bigger than that. But it's not true. Okay? Okay? Turns out that all the real numbers are the same size as the natural number. Oops, sorry, don't do that, don't do that. All the real numbers are the same size as the numbers from 0 to 1. That's a shocking thing, because you would think, oh wow, this is infinite copies of this, but no, they're the same size. And I'd like to show you why. I'm going to take this 0, 1, the numbers from 0 to 1, and I'm going to push them up here, and I'm going to stretch them out a little, like this. I'm going to put 0 here. This is all the numbers from 0 to 1. Here's 1. Here's, let's say, 0 0.5. Here's 0 0.25. Here's 0 0.75. That's all the numbers between 0 and 1. And now I'm going to show, how do I show the two sets are the same size? What I have to do is, I have to pair them off, match them up. So I'm going to show you how I match them up. I'm going to put a little dot in here. I call this the Sunshine Theorem. Okay, it's my own name. Okay, and I'm going to match up all of these numbers with all of these numbers. Ready? I'm going to send 0, I'm sorry, 0 0.5 to there. I'm going to send this, and here's what I do. I match this up with this. I start at the sun, and I let my sunshine hit there. And wherever it hits, it hits. I do it with straight lines. This matches up with this. Okay, now you might say, hey, you missed something here. Well, this number is going to match up with that number. And this number is going to match up with that number. And this number is going to match up with that number. And this number is going to match up with that number. Okay? And the point is, between any of the real numbers here and here, okay, there's an infinite amount of other real numbers. And so you can match each one up very, very carefully. Now, you might say, hey, this, no, this, this goes way down. This goes to Sheep's Head Bay. Well, eventually, whatever number you're going to have there, that's going to match up to this. Okay, so that goes to Sheep's Head Bay. That way is Manhattan. So, eventually, that's going to go on to that. The point is, we are matching up every point in here. You might say, hey, hey, there's an infinite number of points in between there. That's good, because there's an infinite number of points between there and there. And they're the same size infinite. So they're the same thing. Okay? Great. So that answers Mr. Cantor's original question. Cantor asked as follows. He showed all these different sets were really the same size. Now he wants to know what about the real numbers. He couldn't answer the real numbers, so he went to 0, 1. Okay? He found that 0, 1 is really larger than the natural numbers. And now he shows that the real the the zero one is the same size as the real numbers, and so he goes up. Okay, so that answers his original question. I'd like to show you another set that's larger than the natural numbers. Okay, but rather than doing it directly, I'm going to show you as follows. Ready? Take any set S. Pick any set S whatsoever infinite or large. Okay? And now look at the power set of S. Okay? What's the power set? The set of subsets. Okay? These two sets 
are not the same size. They are not equinumers. There's no way in the world you can make them equinumers. Now, this is a little bit shocking. Let me tell you why. Because I spent the first hour of this class showing that seemingly smaller sets or seemingly larger sets or seemingly different size sets can really be made into the same thing. And now I'm telling you, look, there's a rule. Any set, the power set, they can't be made into the same size. This is much bigger than this. This is much bigger than this. Now, the first thing you could say is, look, it's for finite sets. For example, if S has five elements, then the power set has two to the five elements, which is 32. So, for finite sets, there's no way in the world you're going to match up five elements with 32 elements. Just like there's no way you're going to match up 25 students with 40 chairs. No way you're going to match up for finite sets. That's easy, okay, for finite sets. But the question is, what about infinite sets? What about infinite sets? Okay, maybe there's some trick for infinite sets that where they are in fact true. And the answer is no. There is no trick for infinite sets. There is no trick for infinite sets. Okay, they cannot be made equal. The power set is always larger than the set. Okay, and I'd like to prove it. The proof is the same proof as we saw ten minutes, two, two minutes ago, but I'd like to do it again. Okay, okay, and so the proof is, again, a proof by contradiction. Assume for a second that the power set is equal to the same size as the set. The set is the same size. Assume it's equal to, okay. They're equinumers, assume they're equinumers, and I'm going to make a contradiction. Okay, I'm going to find you something that's not. So let's do it. I'm going to call these elements S, I'm going to call them small element S0, S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, dot, 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 dot. This goes on forever and ever. Okay? And now, oh, that's, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Imagine all the subsets. I'm listing the subsets like this. SI is a subset of S. Okay. Okay. And now I want to describe these subsets. And the question is, can I match SI with all these? Can I match these things with all these elements? So I want to show you what you can. S0, S1, S2, S3, S4. S5. Da, da, da. Okay. Now, I have to describe these subsets. Now, how do you describe a subset of elements? Well, what you have to do is you have to tell me, yes or no, yes or no, is this element in this subset? Yes or no? Okay. So, I'm going to say S0 is not in this subset, so I write 0. S1 is not in this subset, so I write 0. S2 is an element of the subset, I'm going to write a 1. S3 is an element of the subset, so I'm going to write a 1. 0, 1, dot, 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 dot. S1 is an interesting set. It contains the entire set, so everything is in S1. S2 just has, you know, even number. Well, it has some of them but not others. S3 corresponds to the subset that contains nothing. What do we call a subset that contains nothing? The empty set. S3 corresponds to the empty set, because everything is zero. Not, none of them are there. Okay? S4 has a lot of elements. 
except as uh, sorry, except as five. Hmm? Six. Almost everything. This one has the singleton. It has one element, just S2. Okay? Etc. etc. Now, if you claim that the set is the same size as the power set, so there's some way of listing off this, there's some way of listing off all this, there's some way of listing off each element, and each element is going to correspond to a subset. Okay? That's what you just claimed. Well, that's very nice. The only thing is, I'd like to show you a subset that you did not find. It's not listed in your listing. Here's the way it looks. You ready? You put a zero here, I'm going to put a one. You put a one here, I'm going to put a zero. You put a one here, I'm going to put a zero. You put a zero here, I'm gonna put a one. You put a one here, I'm gonna put a zero. You put a zero here, I'm gonna put a one. You put a one here, I'm gonna put a zero. You put a one here, I'm gonna put a zero. You put a one here, I'm gonna put a zero. You put a zero here, I'm gonna put a one. Dot dot dot. Okay. Now, this subset, I'm gonna call it S sub little t. Okay? For the new one. I don't want to put N for a new, okay? Okay? Which contains S0, does not contain S1, does not, does not contain S2, contains S3, does not contain S4, contains S5, does not contain S6, does not contain S7, does not contain S8, contains S9, etc., etc. This subset is not on your list. Why is it not on your list? Well, it's not the zeroth set on your list. It's not the first set on your list. It's not the zeroth set because I changed it. The zeroth set does not contain this little s zero, and mine does. This set T does. This one contains s one, and mine does not. This one contain does. This one contains s two, and mine does not. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So ST is the new set, I want to write it like this, it's equal to those S in S, such that S is not an element of S sub S. Okay? They're not an element of that set. So a little bit, this is a little bit, it's the same idea, but it's a little bit more thing. The point is, ST is not in your listing. It's not in your listing. It's different than the listing here. It's different than, it's different than this set because of this element. It's different than this set because of this element. It's different than this set because of this element. It's different than this set because of this element, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not on your listing. Conclusion, there's no way in the world you're going to match them up one to one. No way in the world. Okay, and again, you could try a different scheme, and I'll get a different subset. But there's more subsets than elements. That's the main point. There are more subsets than elements. Great. What do we learn about this? Well, let's do it for an interesting set. Okay. Ready? Take the natural numbers. Take the power set of the natural numbers. There's an infinite, this is an infinite set, this is an infinite set. These sets are not equal. So the first hour of this class we showed that a lot of things are equal. Here we're showing these are larger than that. But one second, we're not finished. This is a set. This is a set. It's a set of sets of numbers. Great. Guess what I can do? I can take the power set of that set. They are not equal. Guess what else I could do? The power set of the power set of the power set of the natural numbers. They are not equal. 
Each one of these are infinite, but they're more and more infinite. Okay? And each one is larger than the previous one, and they're not the same size. So there's not two infinite sets. There are many, many infinite sets. There are many different levels of infinity than just saying, oh, well, the set is infinite. Okay? Okay, one second. Take the set 0, 1. That is a larger set than the natural numbers. Great. Now take the power set of natural of 0, 1. This is subsets of real numbers between 0 and 1. That's larger than 0, 1. They're not the same size. Okay, and guess what else we can do? Take the power set of the power set of 0, 1. Not the same size. Okay, great. Hold up. Okay, so now let's summarize. Well, I have one set with no elements. I have many sets with one elements. Okay, I have an apple. I have a person. Each one of these has one element. Okay, I have many sets with two elements. I have many sets with three elements. Dot, dot, dot. Okay, but then... I started talking about other sets that have more than that have an, more than a finite. All these are finite. We know how to deal with finite. Here's two balls. Here's two squares. Here's three balls. Here's three squares. Okay. But now I want to talk about infinite sets. Okay. So, by the way, these can't be matched up. You're not going to match up any of these sets with these sets. All these sets are the same size. Okay, great. Now I want to talk about the natural numbers. This has not a finite number of elements, but an infinite number of elements. And we saw a hell of a lot of things that are the same size as it. The natural numbers cross the natural numbers. Um, the fractions. The integers primes, they're all the same size. Okay, great. And then we said, you know what? The main center of this thing is that that's, we're not finished. The set 0, 1 is larger than this set. The set of real numbers is larger than this set. Okay. Okay. It turns out also that the power set 0, 1 is equivalent to the power set of the natural numbers. Okay. Okay, but we're not done. Because we can go on. For example, the power set of the power set of the natural numbers is here. The power set of the real numbers, well, the real numbers is a set, the power set is larger. It turns out that these are larger. Um, the power set of 0, 1. If 0, 1 is the same size as the power set of that, as the real number, so then they're the same size. Okay? Great. Now, we need names. We like names. We're going to call all these sets finite. That's pretty obvious. We're going to call all these sets countable infinite. Now, don't get me wrong, you can't count them, but you can start, you can start counting them. You can at least begin to give a scheme for which all of them can be counted, right? Zero, the, what, send, what you send the zero to is the zeroth, then one, then two, then three. Eventually you're going to get wherever you want. You're not going to finish counting, but any number on your list or anything on your list you're going to, you're going to eventually reach. So you can start counting. As opposed to that, we're going to call anything larger than that, we're going to call uncountable infinity. 
means you can't even start counting them. There's no beginning. By the way, what's the first number between 0 and 1? 0, 0.000000? No. Okay, 0 is not in there. 0 0.000001? No. There's between the first number and that, there's an infinite number of numbers. Okay, you can't even start counting it. And the whole point of Cantor's trying to bounce around back and forth was to say, look, there's no scheme to even start counting it. So it's uncountably infinite. Anything, this is called countably infinite, this is uncountably infinite. It goes on forever and ever. Okay, great. So these are names. Anything larger than, this is the only countable, everything larger is, count is countable. Now we need symbols. I call this two. That's a symbol that corresponds to sets that have two elements. This symbol corresponds to sets that have three elements. I need a symbol that corresponds to all these sets. Cantor thought of a symbol and he called it Aleph Zero. Cantor wasn't Jewish, but he knew the Hebrew alphabet and so he called it Aleph Zero. Okay, now, if the natural numbers has Aleph Zero elements, let's write that like this. The natural numbers have Aleph Zero elements, okay? then the power set of the natural numbers have 2 to the Aleph 0 elements. Okay, That's that rule that we saw about the natural numbers. So he, he called this 2 to the Aleph 0. And this he called 2 to the 2 to the Aleph 0. Because this is one step higher. Okay, If this has if all these elements have 2 to the Aleph 0 elements, then you take the power set of them, they have 2 to the 2 to the Aleph 0. Okay, so we have lots of different symbols for all our different levels of infinity. We can go on with those. All those levels of infinity, we can go on with them. Sounds good? Okay. We are now finished section. We are now finished section 4.3. Okay, this is probably the hardest section in the chapter in the book, but it's it's brilliant and it shows not there. There are two levels of infinity. There are infinite levels of infinity, and it's all very nice. Okay, Cantor asks the following question. Now, I just want to. We're not responsible for section 4.4, but there's just one question I want to two in there. There's a lot of interesting things. For example, it gives the axioms of set theory, and if all of mathematics is built on that, so that's kind of very interesting. But I want to point to one question. Cantor asks the following question. Take the natural numbers. Take the numbers R. Natural numbers. Take the numbers, the real numbers. Ask yourself the following question. Is there any infinity in between here and here? Is there any infinity that's in between? I know this is larger than this. But is there any infinity in between? So let's go back to our students, the 25 students and the, and the 40 chairs. Okay? I showed that the, net, the, the chairs are larger than the students. Okay? There are more chairs than students. Because no matter how I mix them up, I'm always going to have more chairs than students. Question, is there anything in between? And the answer is yes, there is. 27 is in between 25 and 40. 31 is between 25 and 40. So there are numbers in between. Now I ask the following question. Are there any size infinities in between here? And Cantor couldn't answer that question. Now we saw he had a lot of time to think about these questions and he spent a lot of time, but he couldn't answer. He says, is there anything That's less than this, but not equal to this. He did not know the answer. He could not prove, but he he could not prove it either way. But he believed. He conjectured. He made what's called the continuum continuum hypothesis. Continuum hypothesis. Now th this says, you know what? There's nothing in between. The 
the one infinity right after the natural numbers is the same as all these. There's nothing in between those and things. Okay, he, he couldn't prove it, but he said, I think the following is true. Okay. I don't want to go into whether it's true or false, but there were two people that worked on this problem. One was Gödel, and he in the 1930s showed one part of this problem. Okay? And the other one was a guy named Paul Cohn. And he finished proving this problem. Cantor did the first half, I'm sorry, Gödel did the first half of it. And Paul Cohn did the second half. Okay. Paul Cohn is interesting because guess which college he went to? Brooklyn College. Okay, so Brooklyn College students do amazing things in their life. Anyways, um, you're not responsible for section four, but I strongly recommend that you read section four. It's a nice chapter. Anyways, that's the end of chapter four. It's 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 worthy of spending time doing. Anyways, thank you very much.